going to ask you to do something real quick, only because I need us in a position, and it's ironic that this Sunday in Advent, we're speaking on joy, and uh, I want you to know how much I appreciate you as a family, as a church. Danielle and I were in Costa Rica at this time last Sunday. You'll hear a little bit about that in a few minutes, but it's interesting as I entered into the building this morning, and I was reminded of how much we have in each other. There was just a sense of, let's call it happiness or, or joy, even in those that were setting up and putting the screens together and the curtains together. There wasn't the usual banter of, oh my word, there was a little bit as we tried to stretch out the vinyl, 50 degrees in vinyl in Florida don't match or mix well, uh, the vinyl on the screens, not our pants. Um, but there was just something in the air this morning. Jack tried to run me over in his car out in the parking lot laughing at me until I told him he'd have to pay the workman's comp if he did that. A couple of you in the back, we joked about my son Austin trying to steal my leftover Buffalo Wild Wings and the consequences that that would have taken yesterday. Austin, don't touch my food ever. You guys heard it. Um, that's an inside joke before us. But I need us to lighten up a little bit this morning. God took us into a thick, serious moment. So I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up. No, you can do it. Stand up. Because I don't want us to be comfortable this morning. God does not desire us to be in a position of comfortable little comfortableness. So I want you to hug your neighbor, smack your neighbor, wake your neighbor up in some way, and say, Merry Christmas. If you need to, jump around a little, get the cobwebs off. I mean, literally smack somebody if you need to. If they look like they're still awake, wake them up. Wake them up. Amen. Amen. Some of you are really taking that literal. Dave's back there just hitting people. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. So last week at this time, by the way, my name's Andy. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time, thank you so much, college students. It's good to see your smiling faces. I hear there's some congratulations in store for some of you parents who had children get engaged over the weekend. Uh, maybe had children or relatives get married over the weekend. Tis the season of love. Amen? Amen. So we were in Costa Rica at this time last year to perform a wedding ceremony. And the place that we were staying just a little bit north of the missions base. And by the means, uh, the, the, the term north, I mean, you know, higher up the mountain. We were at about a 6,000 elevation range up there. And we were at this beautiful camp just up from the missions base. And there's these huge boulders on the campgrounds. Like, and I would imagine, you know, in Florida, we see rocks and we see pebbles and we see sand. Our, our soil isn't as firm, as strong as maybe what they have in the mountains. And so I assumed, I never asked the question, but I assumed that these boulders, these boulders that were positioned in, in landscape type positions throughout the camp were dug up as they excavated the ground to build this little camp. So there were huge ones all over the place. One was created and made into a fountain and several smaller ones throughout the campsite. And on Sunday morning, I'd kind of gone for a walk around the campground, um, which took about 20, 25 minutes to get around and different elevations being on the side of a mountain. And I tried to climb up one of these boulders um, and I tried to move one of these boulders. I think as a, as a man, you never lose the boy in you. So when you see large rocks and you see large objects like this in your mind, you think, I could move that. I could so move that. Well, I couldn't move the boulders. I couldn't even climb up the boulders. They were that big. Now, granted, I'm only five foot nine-ish, and my wingspan isn't that much, and I have a little sticking out here, so trying to climb this smooth rock um, to get up on top of it was pretty much next to impossible. So I'm sitting on this, on the porch of our cabin, and just spending some time with the Lord that morning. And the message for this morning began to get downloaded. And one of the things that the Lord asked me is, do you see yourself as a boulder? 
And I thought it was kind of a funny question, and the Lord asked it again, do you see yourself as one of those boulders? And I thought he meant like firm and strong and, and, and big and mighty, and so I obviously answered, yes, I see myself as one of those boulders. And the Lord's like, no, 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 because yes, you are definitely one of those boulders, but at this time in your life, you're a bit immovable. And I thought it was kind of a funny thing for the Lord to say to me, and he said, right now in your life, I have some movement that I desire inside of you. I have some movement that I desire for you to lead Bay Shore in, but you yourself right now in the mindset that you are and the perspective that you have on church and life and me, you're immovable. And until you allow yourself to become movable, I can't move in you. And it was an interesting conversation to have on the porch of a very windy, rainy day, but the Lord was very, very very, very clear. And we're going to end up in Luke chapter 1. But before you go to Luke chapter 1, I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 1 real quick. And we're going to start with verse 3. And the subheading of this specific, specific passage says, the hope of eternal life. So I would ask us this question, how many of you are filled with the hope of eternity? How many of you are filled with the hope of eternity? I would hope that more than just three hands would go up in this room. We are in serious trouble. How many of you are filled with the hope of eternal life? I got to sit in on a discipleship class Monday morning in Costa Rica. And uh, the director of the class or the teacher of the class is the director of the Rosedale Mennonite Missions, director of the Mediterranean region of Rosedale Mennonite Missions. His name is Kevin Mayer. And so I'm listening to him talk about having internal, uh, an eternal perspective. And he said to the students that were listening, he said, you know, part of our issue is that we see 80 years as a long time. We see 80 years as a long time. And sometimes we, have, we, we don't have the determination to see beyond 80 years. And 78 to 80 years would be the average length of a lifespan in our time and our culture, probably just a little bit lower than that. And as he was speaking to the students, I remembered back to my devotions earlier in the week where it says in 1 Peter 1, it's an encouragement chapter or in verse 3 that says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now listen to this. Now we live with great expectation. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. So be truly glad, glad there is wonderful joy ahead of you, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine and is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Through your faith is, though your faith is far more than precious or mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. We live with great expectation, as it says in verse 3. Would you say that you've been living with great expectation? I know that we all live with expectations. Christmas is just a couple of weeks, maybe a little less than two weeks away. And we're living with great expectation of Christmas Day. And maybe you're planning what your Christmas Day is already going to look like. Maybe you're planning on everybody coming to your house and what you're going to have for for dinner that day, I know on, a, on the way to a basketball game yesterday, Danielle's on her phone in the car and she's planning out a couple of different meals that we have going on during the Christmas week. And we're living in expectation of people arriving and the events and the, the things that we have planned to occur. And it's hit me. It's hit me lately. And it hit me just last Sunday. Am I living in great expectation of my eternity? Am I living in great expectation of getting to, to stand before God Almighty, getting to live in his presence, getting to live in total peace and total joy? 
Or am I living moment to moment, just expecting the next thing that comes around the corner or looking at my schedule and just thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock and then tomorrow morning at 11.30 and then tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock because those are the things on my schedule for tomorrow. And it's okay that I need to be living in, in, in perspective of those things. But if those things aren't lived within a greater expectation of my eternal value in Christ and the eternal existence that I will have far beyond my years and my days on this earth, then I only live for my years and my days on this earth. And I truly believe that if we just live for the 80, if we just live focused on the 80, then we don't make an impact in that 80. We don't make an impact. We don't leave something behind. We had a conversation in our men's Bible study this morning. And I have to think back through my years and my decades. You know, when I was in 20, when I was in my 20s, I spent a good bit of my time wanting and desiring to do things to be significant. Like that was my biggest desire, I think, like to make much of myself. And as much as I loved Jesus and as much as I was climbing into ministry, I have to admit that in my 20s, a lot of it wasn't necessarily about making Jesus Christ significant to those who I was ministering to or around, although that had a part to play in it. It was more about me being significant. It was more about, hey, did you see what I just did for the Lord? And I know that in my 30s, it was a decade of refinement. It was a decade of conviction, and it was a decade of the Lord showing up and real reminding me who I am in Him and giving me this eternal perspective of me being a son of God, a child of God. And now that I'm in my mid-40s, my mid-40s, I'm realizing I don't necessarily need to be significant but I definitely want God to use me to do significant things. To do significant things. I read a book a couple of years back, and it asked this question, or it made this statement. It said, you're either leaving footprints in the sand or you're leaving butt prints in the sand. You're either leaving footprints in the sand or you're leaving butt prints in the sand. Because no matter how hard we try, we're going to leave some sort of print, some sort of print on who we're around. And I believe that with an eternal perspective, in an, with an eternal perspective that goes beyond the 80 years, goes beyond the years that we will spend here on earth, we can make an impact and a difference for God. And so this morning is a bit of a repositioning, if you will, a repositioning of allowing ourselves to be in a place where God can use us to impact those that he's around. If you would, go to Luke chapter 1. And we're going to pick the story up in verse 26. And we find Mary, who is engaged to be Joseph, to engage to Joseph. And it's interesting, we don't quite know what Mary's mindset was before the angel appeared to her. We know that she's been engaged, and we know that in the Jewish custom Probably what would have happened is at some point two goats and a sheep would have been traded by Joseph's parents to Mary's parents. And Mary's parents probably even would have Instagrammed out that Mary was of marrying age, so bring us offers. I know this is harsh and I know this is, is, is so countercultural to where we are, but this is the steps that happened in Mary's day. And so there might have been other families that approached Mary's mom, mom and dad and offered up something for Mary's hand in marriage, but Joseph's family won out. Joseph's family must have been the highest bidder, or Joseph's family found some favor in the eyes of Mary's parents, and so there was this betrothal, and they became engaged. And within that moment of engagement, which they say in the Jewish custom lasted about a year, and Joseph probably went back, and he was preparing a household, building a house, preparing a place for him to come and get married and be married and then go and live their life together and build their family together. And so there was great expectation and great prep preparation. Many of you are, uh, have gone through this with your own kids. You've gone through the planning. You've gone through the yes to the dress. You've gone through uh, the getting the, uh, the save the dates out. You've gone through getting uh, out the announcements. You've gone through planning the wedding. You've gone through booking the caterer. You've gone through planning every little detail that you could of the wedding day. And so that's where we find Mary at in this moment. And so let's pick the story up. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, 
pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestors, David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am but a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. Once more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. You know, I read commentary after commentary trying to figure out why did God choose Mary? Why did God choose Mary? Why of all the women of this time, Obviously, she understood and, and loved God. Obviously, she understood and knew culture. Obviously, she understood and knew the many prophecies of the coming Messiah that she would need to be, that the Messiah would be born of a woman. So obviously, she knew all of that. And the most common answer that I came out with or I came up with in the commentaries were Mary's availability. And I want you to write that if you're taking notes. I want you to write the word availability availability. You can be the best of the best of the best at whatever in the kingdom of God. You can be the smartest. You can be the most intellectual. You can be the strongest. You can be the best looking. You can be the most gifted. You can be all of that and God's still not able to use you because the best gift that we can offer back to God outside of our worship or the best way that we can worship the Lord is with our availability. Our availability. And so this morning I'm praying that the Lord takes us into a place where we're to surrender. I love that Ryan opened up that word for us last week and placed us in a place of surrender. Because I believe that we're going to have to surrender or we're going to need to surrender. The Lord is calling us to surrender some things to open up some availability for the year 2020. And three things that I take from the story is the angel interrupted Mary. And I, I, I want to use that term. The angel literally interrupts Mary's plans. Gabriel shows up right in the midst of probably or, or could be one of the busiest times in Mary's life. And so the three points during this time that I see is one, very first off, is our plans seldom play out exactly as we draw them up. In verse 26 and 27, we see that it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. We've just talked about the fact that Mary was right in the middle of her engagement. There had to be moments of dreams, and, and, and many of the women in the room that are married or even those that aren't, you're, you've dreamed of your day. You've pictured your day. You've had your day. And it's usually a day you're, you don't forget. It's one of the harder things as a pastor to do wedding ceremonies is because you know good and well you are in the midst of a day that's been dreamed about. You are in the midst of a day that's been planned about, and you don't want to do anything to mess that up. It's one of the most nerve-wracking things for me anyway. I actually spend more time praying as I enter into wedding ceremonies than maybe even sermons because of that. Because you know that you're you know that you are serving a family. You know that you're entering into a time that will not be forgotten. And that's where Mary is at. Last weekend I was a part of what was deemed the most imperfect, perfect wedding ceremony that I've ever been. The best man said it correctly when he said at the reception, this was the most imperfect, perfect wedding I've ever been a part of. We were in Costa Rica. The couple had been engaged for about five months. They put all their plans together. Earlier in the week, plan A for the venue fell out. On about Tuesday-ish or Wednesday of the week, 
plan A for the venue fell apart, and they had to switch to plan B. So we're already shifting gears. We're up in the mountains of Costa Rica, and when you hear the word Costa Rica, much like Florida, you think of sun and beaches. We were nowhere near any of that. We were in the cold 50-degree weather of 25 to 30 mile an hour sustained winds, mountains of Costa Rica, rain coming in and out throughout the days leading up to it, and it's wedding day. And wedding day had proven to be a little bit nicer of a day, but about 45 minutes before the wedding ceremony, it decides to start dumping again. And so we're faced with the reality of this wedding's going to be wet. And I sat with the bride and her mom and dad, and we were trying to decide what to do because the inside portion of the place we were at would not have done well. And I look at her and I say, well, we can speed this up a little bit. One, if we don't translate the ceremony. Two, if I just don't preach everything that I, I have on my message. And she quite agreed to that really quickly. Um, when I said I could just paraphrase, she's like, yeah, 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 do that, do that, do that. I seemed way too eager for that portion of it. Back and forth, I'm running back and forth between her and the groom, saying to the groom, are you okay with us not translating this? And he's, I loved his response. His response every time was, what does Carmelinda want? I'm like, you're going to do well. You're going to do real well. And at one point, we sit down, and Dad asks her, what do you want to do, honey? And she looks at us, and it broke my heart. She goes, I want God to make it stop raining. But it didn't. And so we get right out in the midst of this 50-degree weather, maybe 60s, wet and rainy, and we walk him up the aisle, and we did the ceremony. I just transfer my notes out of my Bible into another notebook because I didn't want my Bible to get ruined. I'm looking down the end of the aisle at my wife and uh, uh, another woman standing underneath an umbrella, and it's raining, and I'm looking at the, the, the bride's mom over here, and she's getting wet, and I'm like, I got to do this quick. I got to do this quick. And I would ask you not to listen to Danielle if she tells you that this all proves that Andy can preach 10-minute sermon. That's not, that's not what we found out. What I did find out is that the bride and groom were able to roll with the punches. All the plans that they had laid out, all the decorations that they had laid out, none of that came to pass. In the last moment of this wedding ceremony, everything changed. We, we sped up the ceremony, and yet they still got married. One of the... One of the pastors that was in from Ohio as well that was just there spoke over them and said, the Lord wanted your wedding to be this way because your lives are going to be this way. And it hit me. Maybe all of our lives should be just a little bit this way because I'll be honest, I had to ask the question, had this taken place in the States, what would we have done? Had this play taken place here, how would we have handled it? How would we have maneuvered? How would, would we have been flexible enough? And then I look at the story of Mary and I realize in the midst of the greatest moment of her life, as she's looking towards marrying Joseph, the angel shows up and says, oh, by the way, you're pregnant. Church, this is a little bit different than our culture. Like in our culture, this would have been disappointing to hear that a bride-to-be is pregnant. But in this culture, it could literally be a death wish. In this culture, it destroys and ruins everything. And the angel shows up and says to Mary, oh, by the way, you're pregnant. Mary has to go back to Joseph. Mary has to go to her parents. Mary has to go to Joseph's parents. Mary has to go to her BFFs. She has to tell them, I'm pregnant. I mean, imagine this conversation. Hey, by the way, I'm pregnant, and it's God's. Remember all those prophecies? Like, it's God's. It's God's. Which brings me to what I, I love about Mary, and, and I would encourage all of us in our lives to be this. Our second point is, when in doubt, because there had to be doubt. There had to be frustration. It said she was disturbed by this. It literally says she was disturbed. But when in doubt, inquire from above. In verse 34, we see that Mary asked, but how can this happen? 
The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and will be called the Son of God. Now remember my, remember my imagination. I imagine this conversation going a little bit differently. Luke, who was the writer of Luke in the book of Acts, was a Gentile physician. And it was kind of, Luke and the book of Acts were written in a perspective so that the Gentiles would believe that Jesus is who he said he was. So that the Gentiles would believe. And, and it's very detailed. Luke, being a physician, detailed out things a little bit better. Matthew is the other account of, of Jesus' birth. And you really don't hear much about Mary. You see it more from Joseph's perspective. But Luke had more details here. But in my imagine, excuse me, in my imagination, I see this a little different. I see Mary with the angel and it taking a little bit more time and, and, and her arguing back and her saying to Gabriel, Gabriel, I know you were there at the beginning of time. You know, I, I know you saw God make Adam and Eve and I, I know you saw him take Adam and Eve out of the dust and breathe life into him and then take a rib from Adam and make Eve. And, and you know, I know you saw that, but that's not the way we do this anymore. Like, that's not the way babies are made anymore. I don't know, Gabriel, if you've noticed this, but, but it, it takes a husband and a wife. And Gabriel looks at her, and he says, not so with you. Not so with you. The Holy Spirit is producing the baby inside of you, and the power of the Most High has overshadowed you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. Now, what's interesting in this moment is, I think all of us have, have and, I, and I would hope, I would hope that at some point in your walk with Christ, you've heard from God in some way, shape, or form. You've, had, you've felt a call on your life from God in some way, shape, or form. This is a pretty insurmountable moment for Mary. I mean, as she laid her head on her pillow, as she got up the next morning, as she walked through speaking into her own life or, or, or trying to challenge her, like the question of how do I share this news and make it believable? I think many of us have had calls on our lives from God that we've had to, to simply try to convince others that it was of God. I know that there's been different moments in my life where people didn't understand the call on my life. People didn't understand why I was leaving this place or that place. People didn't understand why I was stepping out. I remember when I stepped into ministry out of the company that I worked for, one of the owners of the company said, do you understand what you're leaving? And here's Mary who's got to go convince Joseph. We've got, who's got to go convince Joseph that she's pregnant and that the father of the baby is God himself. And if you go back to Matthew, you, re you realize that, that Joseph didn't believe her. She goes and she, is ex she explains it to Joseph, but it took Gabriel showing up and showing Joseph that it was okay. It says that once Joseph found out, he decided to, to be honorable and take Mary and put her away. He didn't believe her right at first. And could you imagine being Joseph now, trying to explain to your parents and trying to explain to your friends? In a culture where this was a death ticket. In a culture where Mary could be taken outside of the city and stoned for adultery. And I love the angel's answer. The Lord will make a way. The Lord's made the way. The Lord will make a way. And so when the voice of the Lord begins to work in you and redirect you or reposition you, don't be afraid to inquire from above. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to allow the Lord to detail out the steps or, or exactly what's taken place because that's what he did for Mary. And then finally, we need to get to a place just as Mary did that we trust in the word that we've been given. Mary had to walk out of this conversation with the angel trusting in what the angel had just told her. For the word of God will never fail, is what the angel says to her. And Mary responds, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. I want to pinpoint that moment for just a second. 
May everything that you've said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Let's put ourselves in Mary's shoes in just that, in, in that moment. From all accounts, I can see that it was just Mary and the angel. And then the angel left her. And then the angel left her. I don't know about you, but I have a tendency of talking myself out of things that the Lord is asking me or calling me to do. I have a tendency of rationalizing things in my mind. I have a tendency of once I'm left alone after prayer time or after time in the word or after a worship time and the Lord's given me a direction or the Lord has redirected me or the Lord has totally showed up and, and, and totally changed everything. I have a tendency of rationalizing. I have a tendency of arguing within myself. I can easily talk myself out of it. The angel left her. And Mary is left in this moment by herself. There's no baby that she can tell yet. There's no bump. That wouldn't happen until months down the road. And she's in this window between, she's in this window between the angel leaving her and her having to begin to declare this to the people around her. I believe this is one of the most crucial moments in all of us. I believe this is one of the most crucial moments in all of our calling. Because these are the moments. These are the moments where, whether we know it or not, the enemy can use our own rationale to talk us out of things. Especially in our culture. What I love about here is Mary most likely knew she had no choice. Much like the wedding in, in Costa Rica... We looked at it and we decided, you know, we have no choice. You either, if you want to get married today, you're going to do it and you're going to get wet. And I wonder sometimes if we haven't positioned ourselves in a place where we've taken away our own rationale. We've taken away faith. We've taken away trust. Maybe we've positioned in ourselves in a place where we're not even necessarily hearing because here's a crazy question. Here's a crazy question. If the angel of the Lord were to show up today in your life, is there space for him to be able to speak? If the Holy Spirit were to show up today to speak to you about your future, is there room for you to hear that voice? Because I believe that's why God chose Mary, because there was space in Mary's life for the angel to show up. Mary was positioned in a place of willingness. She was positioned in a place of availability. And unfortunately, I think in our culture, I know for me, I had to get all the way out of this country and be in the mountains of Costa Rica where there was no TV, really no telephone, and sporadic Wi-Fi in order for God to really show up in a way that he hadn't showed up in a long time. And I still battled some of the things that he was saying to me. So my question this morning is, what position are you in? And maybe there's a moment where the Lord would like to do some repositioning. Maybe there's a moment where the Lord would like to do some repositioning. Because I don't know about you, I'm going to steal one of these chairs. Rich, you're now on the front row. Welcome. Maybe, maybe I spend too much of my life in a position where I'm distracted. Where I have too much going on. And there's no room for the Lord to speak. Maybe I'm opening my calendar too much. Maybe I'm putting too many items or too many meetings or too many things. Maybe there's not space enough in my day for, angel, for the angel to show up. Maybe, just maybe, my availability is being decreased by what I have around me.
all good things, all great things, all things that the Lord has provided for us and placed in our lives. But maybe in our culture, We're not positioned in a place of spontaneity. And maybe when the Lord does come and does show up and asks us to redirect, in a quote-unquote, I've heard from the younger generation, there's this term, God wrecked me. God wrecked my schedule. God wrecked my day. It's a good term. But I think as we grow later on in life, as we grow later on in life, our lives are just too filled. And somewhere, church, hear my, hear my heart on this. Somewhere, church, we're okay with that. I read an article about reverence. Reverence to the Lord and how generations before the media craze and generations before TVs and generations before phones generations before all the technology that we have nowadays, people were able to stop. If you noticed at the beginning of our service or right as I came up, I had to stop and be still. Stop and be still. Friday of last week, I was in Costa Rica with no communication, no TV, and I, it drove me nuts. but I'm thankful for being detached for about five days. I look at Mary and look at the plans that she was planning, at the angel showing up, redirecting those plans. Church, our culture doesn't, we don't enjoy that. We don't enjoy when our plans don't play out exactly the way we draw them up. We don't spend a whole lot of time inquiring from above anymore. And because of that, then we have a hard time trusting in above. So when the music fades and all is stripped away, what do we have? What do we have? I spend 12 hours a day working and I've worked so hard that I get home and I'm too tired to engage. Or maybe I've worked too late into the night. I get up in the morning, I'm too tired to engage. When you've positioned yourself in a place of unmovability, you're immovable. You can't be moved. And I would dare to say, you have become Lord of your life. I would dare to say you have become Lord of your life. If the Lord himself can't enter into our plans, 